come in handy. Why don't you open to Ephesians chapter 5 as we, uh, we continue here. And as you're doing that, it's going to uh, tell you a little, a little background story. I've got a PowerPoint slide of a, uh, of a, a plane going into the water. And actually, this, uh, this plane uh, crash took place in 1996. Uh, this was back in the day when, when people hijacked a plane. Uh, it was to get them to take them somewhere, uh, not, not to fly uh, that plane uh, into a building and so forth. Uh, and uh, the guys that hijacked this plane, uh, leaving, uh, leaving Africa, uh, wanted it flown to Australia. And uh, uh, on board that aircraft was uh, a man named uh, Andy uh, Meekins. He had been a missionary, he and his wife, for, uh, in Africa for many, uh, many years, a, a British uh, missionary. Uh, and uh, they were on board uh, going, going home af- after many years. Uh, the problem was, uh, and the pilot tried to explain to them, uh, there was no way they had enough fuel to make it all the way to, uh, to Australia. This whole thing was actually in the news and was captured on videotape uh, from a boat that uh, saw the whole thing uh, go uh, into the water. By the time they got to the uh, Comoros Islands uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, the pilot came on and explained that uh, one of the engines had just flamed out and the other one would go uh, any minute. He was just letting them know they're, they're going to be uh, hitting the water. Uh, I, and I just want to read, this is from me. I just read this this week. It's from uh, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association monthly uh, uh, newsletter. Uh, and the writer there, I'm not sure if it's, I believe it's Franklin Graham that's writing this, uh, uh, goes on to explain that, uh, uh, quote, many of us might die in this crash, he called out, Andy. Uh, so there's something you need to know. Andy then beginning explaining the gospel simply and urgently, moving to uh, each part of the cabin so that everyone would hear. Uh, he invited people to place their trust in Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. A flight attendant heard Andy's words, bowed her head, and asked Jesus to forgive her sins uh, and come into her heart. She watched many more people respond, along with another survivor who later told the story. Of the 175 people on board, 125 died, including Andy was still on his feet preaching the gospel when the plane hit, hit the water. Uh, this is as his wife stayed buckled in. And she, uh, she recalled how, uh, you know, the, uh, when the captain made that announcement, she heard the, the seat belt unbuckle next to her. And she knew exactly uh, what her husband was going to do. Uh, Franklin goes on and says, Every day tens of thousands of people slip from this world into eternity. The vast majority unprepared, dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, We need to take every opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel, the only message that will make a difference to a lost soul. Just like the airplane going down, time is running out. That's very pertinent to our our message in this passage uh, this morning where Paul will tell us we need to redeem the time that we live in because the days are evil. Uh, And as we'll explain, that, uh, uh, that means that we need to be able to see not just chronological time, but there are seasons and opportunities that the Lord uh, gives us. Uh, this whole section, again, in Ephesians, the very practical part of the epistle began in chapter 4 uh, with the exhortation to walk uh, worthy of the calling with which you are called. And just as uh, uh, the, it is a word picture, uh, as we've said uh, many times now, the word worthy is the, is the word for a balanced scale. So on one side of the scale is our walk. And again, that's just a, uh, a metaphor for how we live uh, and then our calling, what God has called us to. And obviously there needs to be a balance uh, in, in those things. Uh, five different sins have been uh, mentioned. Uh, Paul's told us to avoid them and he explained why. Uh, but again, the, uh, the overreaching reason for all these things is because of our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we looked at that uh, last time in verse 30 of chapter 4 where Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day uh, of redemption. Uh, and again, it marvels us the idea that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, God's Spirit uh, resides in us. Uh, lives in us, and apparently there's things we can do, there's behaviors that we can have that grieve, and actually it means to cause pain to, uh, the, the, to God himself, uh, the Holy Spirit. It's a, a very uh, uh, interesting thought. It should uh, certainly be a motivation for us. Uh, our second image that we kind of captured uh, uh, beginning in chapter 5 was that of a, of a mirror. Uh, there in, uh, in chapter 5, Five verse one it says therefore be imitators of God as dear children 
and there's our metaphor again, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering, as a sacrifice for a sweet-smelling aroma. So then, again, the, the therefore. Our lives are to be different uh, than people that do not know Christ. The idea is our lives are to mirror that of Christ. As Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of uh, of Jesus Christ. And then he went on and said there should be no immorality uh, in our lives. And he gave us five reasons for that. And that's what we looked at last time. Uh, we ended with verse 14 where he says, therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. So apparently even as believers, we can be asleep at the wheel. Uh, we can be acting like uh, we're dead spiritually. Uh, but if we'll wake up, he says, Christ will give you light. And again, all these things have been very challenging, and all this has been leading actually to this passage here, uh, and there'll be a lot of very practical things he says after this that will, uh, that will come out of it, this idea that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. As we uh, look at it, we'll talk about the fact that it's not a suggestion, <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a, a command. Uh, and uh, let's look at the first part of our text, verse 15 to 17 where he says we need to uh, live our lives carefully. Verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So he makes two statements and then gives us a reason uh, to follow them. And he says we're to be careful and wise. Uh, walking circumspectly, uh, that word is, comes from two Latin words meaning to look around. Uh, the Greek word has the idea, it's a mathematical term, it talks about precision and accuracy. It would be the opposite of, of walking or living carelessly without any guidance or, or, or forethought uh, at all. Uh, it's the idea of walking in wisdom. We should be walking in wisdom, so therefore we need the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. Of course, I would suggest there's a whole book about how to live a wise life. It's called Proverbs. Uh, also beneficial and constantly contrasting the person that walks wisely and the person that walks foolishly. Uh, he tells us this is so important because the days that we're living in uh, are evil. Uh, he's going to go on in uh, our messages after this and talk about the fact of how this applies in, an, in a Greek text. It's more obvious uh, that in verse 5, uh, as we'll see, uh, you know, as it continues, uh, he's going to talk to the wives, the husbands, the children, the fathers, the servants, uh, and then uh, in chapter 6, verse uh, 9, the masters, and then he'll say, finally, and then he'll go on to the last section of the book. Uh, what we see then is that the filling of the Holy Spirit should impact our marriages, our families, uh, and our businesses, and it's the only way we're going to be able to do the things he's asked us to do up to this point, avoid the things he's asked us to uh, avoid. Uh, again, uh, if we're going to be light, awake up and be light, the only way we'll be able to do that is if we're really a spirit-filled a believer. Secondly, he tells us not just to be careful about our lives, but to buy back time. Again, the English word here uh, sometimes is translated opportunity, uh, it comes from a Latin, to, uh, towards the port. It uh, suggests a ship that is able to take advantage of the wind and the tides and tide in order to get somewhere. It also speaks of the brevity of life and how, how short it is. That's our, our opening uh, illustration there. Uh, this idea that uh, uh, when that missionary realized he had but moments, he was going to go into eternity, but he had to get up and share the gospel. It was just a short season. It was a short opportunity. Uh, and a lot of us can probably recount the times when we've seized uh, those opportunities, when, uh, when somebody has said something to us about God, the Bible, our lives, or, or something, and it'd be like, okay, I think this is it here. You know, seldom is somebody going to say, by the way, what must I do to be saved? Although I had one guy one time say that, it was pretty easy to lead him to the Lord. He's the man that built this pulpit, by the way. But uh, by and large, it's, uh, we have to kind of, we have to be filled with the Spirit of God if we're going to be able to see those opportunities. Uh, and you and I have all had those times where we walked away from a conversation and went, I just blew it. The guy, that was totally an open door. The guy was asking me about meaning or purpose. He was asking about why that earthquake just occurred in Nepal. If there's a God of God of love, how could he? Uh, there's just, you know, oppor opportunities. 
uh, that uh, sometimes are there that are presented and we missed. And we need to be careful because the, the days are evil. We need to be able to make the most uh, of every opportunity. Uh, and again, that word opportunity very often translated redeemed. Redeemed is used three ways in the New Testament. To redeem a slave in order to serve you. To redeem a slave in order to set him free. To redeem a slave in order to make him your son or your daughter. Uh, that's the idea here. Uh, we buy back, we can buy back time uh, to, to make it useful uh, to, to us uh, and to the kingdom of God. Uh, and we need to be careful about our lives so that we'll be able to do that. Again, the word uh, here in the Greek is chronos. It doesn't mean chronological time. It means seasons and special opportunities. And we've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit or we're going to miss them. Uh, and the ideas and the days are evil. That has a connotation of itself, but it also means that uh, there's only a few of them or life is short and we need to be careful about our lives. That's what Andy Meekins did when he only had uh, moments to, to live. Uh, again, we need to be spirit-filled in order not to miss the opportunities. Uh, thirdly, it's because the days are evil. And again, it's not speaking of the fact that they're just intrinsically evil. It means an active opposition to good. Although we can look around the world today and, and think, no, I think they're intrinsically evil, you know, with some of the things going on in the, uh, in the Middle East and the persecution of Christians and so forth. Uh, but again, every, every day is filled for us as believers with active opposition against us trying to do good or do something to advance the kingdom of God. That's, that's the idea. Uh, and I think that we probably sense that and see that and feel that kind of pressure here in the United States, here in Hawaii, uh, more, more than ever uh, through uh, lawsuits against Christians, laws that are being passed ag against religious freedom uh, and so forth. And when there is a law uh, passed to uh, protect religious freedom, then there's a great, great outcry from uh, the business world and Hollywood uh, uh, and everything else. There's certainly some active opposition. The days are evil. Uh, we're not going to be able to seize the opportunities and the seasons and the moments if we're not filled with the Spirit. We'll, we'll just miss it. Uh, fourthly, there's a basic need to understanding the Lord's uh, will. Uh, we're told to be wise, uh, and this ties uh, uh, directly into it. Uh, understanding suggests the idea that we discover and apply. Uh, again, Romans 12 talks about knowing God's will, and it's important to know God's will. Uh, but once we know what God's will is, we then need to do it uh, or figure out how it applies to a, a given situation. Uh, and that's what Paul's saying here. There's a basic need to know that. Again, Romans 12 is probably the classic passage on uh, knowing God's will. Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Uh, and do not can be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable uh, and perfect uh, will of God. Uh, it's uh, important to know the will of God. Uh, there's a lot of things that are just black and white uh, in the scriptures, that it, and this is God's will for you. And it just says what it is. Uh, uh, not forsaking the assembly together to have gratitude in your heart. And we could just go on and on. But there's a lot of things that are gray areas we, we, we don't know. Do I take that job? Do I don't take that job? We pray about it. We're trying to seek God's uh, in our lives. We're not going to be able to do that if we're not filled uh, with the Spirit. That's the idea. Understanding is the application. Uh, we need won't be able to do that without the filling of the Spirit of God in our lives. That gets to our second point in verse 18. Uh, very simply, there's a controlling influence in our lives. And Paul uh, uses uh, uh, an illustration here that, that would be uh, uh, very easy to understand for the people in Ephesus, probably for us as well. Verse 18, uh, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And again, there's a comparison very limited comparison, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of ways in which these two ideas contrast uh, against each other. Uh, very simply, we're not to be controlled by alcohol. Therefore, Christians are commanded not to get drunk many times in the Bible and, uh, and certainly uh, throughout the Old Testament. 
It was an issue in Ephesus. It's where the, uh, the, the god Bacchus uh, was, uh, was worshipped. It was wine country. You could probably compare Ephesus to the Napa Valley. Uh, there, was a, there was a lot of people that were involved in the industry uh, and so forth. It was very common. It dominated uh, their lives. Uh, and, uh, and so Paul warns against it. He chooses this as a, uh, an illustration. Uh, and, uh, and certainly as it was a problem in, uh, in Paul's day and his culture in the first century, it's, it's a huge uh, problem uh, in our day. And I'll, I'll give you a few statistics to let you know how, how bad it uh, really is. People drink for a lot of different reasons. Uh, to interrupt the, the um, monotony of life, to escape life, but uh, uh, it, uh, it changes your personality. Uh, one writer said uh, it makes some people happy and it makes some people belligerent. It makes some people weepy, it makes others sing. It makes some people shout, it makes some people generous, and it makes others steal. Uh, most, most often it's a temporary ego elevation. Coward becomes a hero, the bore a philosopher, and the wimp a terminator. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it changes your personality. Uh, that's the idea. It controls you. You drink enough, enough alcohol, it changes your personality. It takes control of you. Uh, and, and again, that's the idea. There's the, uh, rather than that, instead of that, uh, our lives need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, this term uh, dissipation, the NIV uh, uses the term, uh, I like it better, maybe it's a little more graphic, uh, debauchery. I, I think we maybe grasp that word uh, a little bit better. But as I mentioned, I wanted to read through a couple of statistics. What does that mean, dissipation? What does it mean, debauchery, in terms of what alcohol leads to? Uh, I just want to read you some statistics so you'll be clear as to what it leads to. Uh, currently in the United States, uh, there are 16 million alcoholics. 76 million people do not drink but have an alcoholic in their immediate family. And it, uh, it consumes them and ruins their family. 10 to 15% of people in my age group, over 60, are alcoholics. Almost one in, more than 1 in 10. Alcohol is the number one drug problem in the United States. Larger than cocaine, larger than heroin, or any other drug. In the last 50 years, more people have died from alcoholism than all the people that died in combat in World War I and World War II combined. Currently, 25 to 40 percent of all hospital beds in this country are occupied with someone with an illness or an injury related to alcoholism. 50 percent of all traffic deaths are related to alcohol. 65 people die every day from alcohol-related death. That's one every 30 minutes. Someone is injured because of alcohol every two minutes. 50 percent of all falling deaths are related to alcohol. 52% of people who die in fires is related to alcohol. 60% of all suicides are related to alcohol. 64% of all murders are related to alcohol. 69% of all drownings are related to alcohol. 72% of all robberies and assaults are related to alcohol. 60% of all rapes are related to alcohol. 80% of our criminal court cases are related to alcohol. 50% of teen driving deaths are related to alcohol. It is the most destructive force in our culture next only to abortion. Today, 77% of high school students have used or are using alcohol. 77%, that's almost 8 out of 10. 44% of all 8th graders have tried or drank alcohol. That's almost half the kids uh, in 8th grade. Uh, one out of nine, and some say, say uh, go as high as one out of 14. If you take one drink, you'll never be able to stop. And some, some statistics are one in eight. In other words, if you have, you're playing Russian roulette, and you had a chamber that had a dozen chambers, and you put a bullet and you spun it, would you put it to your head? But that's what a person does if they take a drink uh, for the very, very first time. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, the, uh, it's just uh, mind-boggling. Uh, the cost of alcoholism to businesses in the United States is $186 billion every year. Uh, we spend more money treating alcoholism than we do treating cancer uh, in this country. And that's what dissipation or debauchery means statistically. Uh, and I have to tell you, the reason I'm going through this, because I want to emphasize the filling of the Spirit, not this side of the illustration, uh, but I just see it changing in my age and my generation. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the younger generation, when I got saved, these are the things we repented of and turned from. But there's a whole generation of Christians, even in Calvary chapels out there, 
some other very good churches that somehow drinking has become socially acceptable, uh, which uh, I don't really understand. Everybody's got to make their own decisions. But I think you need to understand what's going on in, uh, in the culture uh, around us. This is what the Bible's own commentary on drunkenness is. It's in Proverbs 23, uh, 29. Here the writer, again, Solomon says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? And he's describing somebody that's, that drinks. Uh, he's saying they have physical problems. They will have emotional problems. They'll have problems with relationships. And he goes on in verse 30 and says, Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine, that's with the higher alcohol content, uh, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast, saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? It impacts your physical ability, certainly. You're like a man on a ship being rocked about. Uh, you can be beaten. Things can happen to you physically, and you're just uh, completely unaware. But the punchline at the end is, when shall I awake that I may have another drink? Why? Because it's addictive. That's what the Bible has always said. And that's what we see in our, in our culture today. Again, the theme here is walk wisely <laughs> instead of foolishly. Be careful about your life. Walk circumspectly. Kind of have a plan. Uh, figure it out. Your, your, your life can really count for something, but the days are evil. They're pushing against us the other way as, as believers. So secondly, and most importantly, uh, we're to be controlled by the Spirit. Again, comparison and contrast. The comparison is you can be under the influence of both. That's where it ends. <laughs> That's the only comparison. You can be under the influence of alcohol. People understand that. We understand that. But you should be under the influence uh, of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Uh, that's uh, uh, certainly you can be influenced by your sin nature and so forth. But for the sake of illustration, he wants us to see how important it is uh, to be under the influence or controlled. That's what we, the idea of influence, it's control uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, here's the contrast, and there's many. With alcohol, you lose control. Uh, with the Holy Spirit, you gain self-control. Now, you know, I've, I've heard some very strange teachings about the Holy Spirit. I've seen some very strange things uh, uh, happen in churches via the Holy Spirit. Both of my grandmothers are both Pentecostal. I've seen some sights <laughs> to behold. Actually, it was very frightening as a, as a, as a kid. Uh, this is all under the guise of the Holy Spirit, where people seem to lose control under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that's not possible. Uh, it's, it's quite the opposite. You gain control. Galatians 5, uh, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. What does the Holy Spirit produce? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. What's the last one? Self-control. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul writing to Timothy, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and a sound mind. You know, NIV would say self-control. Uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit gives us self-control. Being filled with alcohol, that's the contrast, uh, you lose control. Uh, secondly, the drunk makes a fool of himself, and the Spirit-filled Christian glorifies God and is willing to be a fool for Jesus Christ. The drunk calls attention to himself. The spirit-filled believer is a witness for Christ. He directs the attention uh, to the Lord. Alcohol is a depressant. Uh, the spirit is a stimulant. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who one of the great preachers of his uh, generations and one of my favorite authors, uh, was a medical doctor who got called into the ministry. And, and as a medical doctor, he says this about drinking. Uh, drink is not a stimulus, it's a depressant. It depresses first and foremost the highest centers uh, of all in the brain. They are the very first to be influenced and affected by drink. They control everything that gives a man self-control, wisdom, understanding, discrimination, judgment, balance, the power to assess everything. In other words, everything that makes a man behave at his very best and highest, uh, the better a man's control 
uh, the better man he is. But drink is something which immediately gets rid of control. That indeed is the first thing it does. Now, I've often said, uh, I'm dumb enough already. I don't need some, something to make me dumber. You know, so I, I don't really uh, get it, but, uh, uh, but uh, there's, uh, there's a culture that out, uh, that's out there that says uh, uh, it's okay, it's acceptable, everybody's doing it. Uh, very difficult for the guys in the military. It's a drinking culture. Uh, certainly, uh, guys, guys that work construction, it's a drinking culture. Uh, but uh, uh, there's just a lot of areas where, boy, you're going to have to uh, uh, really go against the cultural norms if, if you're going to walk circumspectly and carefully and have uh, the control of the Holy Spirit uh, in your lives. I, uh, if you think about it, uh, I, I just don't know many people that uh, uh, would wish they had less self-control. <laughs> I think generally we're, <laughs> we wish we had more. Uh, in John's Gospel, Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit in our lives, John seven thirty seven, On the last day, the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Living waters uh, flowing, torrents out from us uh, in terms of uh, experiencing God's spirit, which produces his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what it produces uh, in our lives. Uh, uh, five, the fifth thing uh, in terms of this uh, contrast, uh, being drunk is associated with an unintentional life. <laughs> People do things they weren't planning on doing. Uh, being filled with the Spirit uh, is not unintentional, as I said. It's a command. And uh, I'll go over this with you again at the end, but uh, the be filled with the Spirit uh, is, uh, in a Greek, we say it's an imperative, which means it is a command. It's plural, uh, and therefore it's not just for a few. This is for every Christian. It's not for a select few, a certain group, uh, a certain denomination, or whatever it is. People that live on the East Coast versus the West Coast. Now, this is in the plural. It's for all Christians. Uh, the verb is uh, present tense, uh, so it's continual. It's be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. Every believer receives the Holy Spirit in our lives when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, His Spirit is not going to leave us, not going to depart, not going to forsake us. Uh, but this is di- apparently a different ministry of the Holy Spirit where we need to keep asking on a regular, continual, when we need all the time basis Uh, to be filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. It's present tense. Uh, The verb is also passive, uh, which means uh, it's not something we do, it's something done to us. Uh, It's the Holy Spirit that comes in uh, and takes uh, takes control. The verb fill has nothing to do with contents or quantity, as though we're empty vessels and and we need a required amount in order to be filled. It just means controlled by. I'm feeling really empty today. I need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Well, I understand the metaphor, but that's not what it's talking about. To be filled with means to be controlled by. Let me give you a couple examples of other places it's used in the New Testament. In Luke 4, 28, it says, they were filled with wrath. It means they were controlled by wrath. And that was one of the reasons they, they tried to, the Pharisees tried to, uh, wanted to kill Jesus. They were filled with wrath. They were controlled by it. Uh, Acts 13, 45, the Jews were filled with envy. Uh, uh, it means they were opposing the ministry uh, of Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul because they were controlled by this emotion of envy uh, towards them. So to be filled with the Spirit means to be constantly controlled by the Holy Spirit in our mind, in our emotions, and in our wills. Uh, we need to live very carefully. The days are evil. Uh, there can be a controlling influence in our lives. It could be your flesh, we'd say, or your sin nature and so forth, uh, habit patterns of the, of the past, whatever it might be, or it can be the Holy Spirit. Uh, thirdly, our communication is to be a blessing to God uh, and to others. That's in verse 19 to 21. Again, Paul writing, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So our communication is manifested in four ways if we're filled with the Spirit. 
the person filled with the Spirit of God, uh, he will exhibit or manifest these things. Uh, and they're all S's. It's easy to remember. And the first one is speaking, the way that we speak uh, to, to one another. Uh, and it's very easy. I had to do a little bit of uh, uh, researching and reading uh, about, uh, you know, what really is a psalm. You know, we think about psalms uh, in, the, uh, in the Bible itself. Uh, but these are songs specifically, a psalm specifically is a song that speaks of the attributes and abilities of God. Now, these aren't things that we're, we're singing. We're going to get to singing next. These are what we speak to one another if we're controlled by the Spirit of God. Somebody's uh, discouraged. Somebody's going through uh, a difficult time. Uh, we can speak to them. We can choose to speak to them about the abilities of God to heal, uh, the abilities that God has. Uh, the attributes of God in his love, uh, in his mercy. If we're controlled by the Spirit, we want to minister to somebody, uh, we'll speak to them uh, in Psalms uh, and speak to them about God's abilities uh, in his limitless, limitless resources. It can be a blessing, can be very encouraging. And sometimes, again, we'll, we'll think, man, I, I, I should have said this to that person. I can't believe I didn't. Uh, and it's because we're not, we're not filled with the Spirit, because we need to constantly be asking that we would be controlled by the Spirit of God. Hymns, uh, these would be songs that are directed to God. Uh, specifically, they contain reference uh, to, uh, to Jesus Christ and what He's done for us on the cross. Now, there's, uh, uh, we think of hymns, of those are the songs that are hard to sing that are in the hymnal. <laughs> uh, they're the songs that are written in King James. And they go really high and really low. And uh, uh, they've got beautiful lyrics, but we'd rather quote them than sing them because they're a little difficult. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it, it, it really is talking about something. These are things we say to one another uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, again, this is a, a very specific. It's not talking about what we say to non-believers. It's what we say to each other is in the context here. Uh, and sometimes it's a psalm. Sometimes uh, it's a hymn. It's something to do with Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. We have an example of a, a hymn in Revelation 5, 9, where it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain uh, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And by the way, that is... Uh, you might want to take note of those lyrics. That is a song. I don't know if they'll have PowerPoint in heaven, but uh, it is a song that will be, if they do, it'll be awesome. But uh, if uh, uh, it'll be, uh, I got a feeling we'll just know and uh, be able to sing this song in heaven. Remember when Paul and Silas were imprisoned uh, in, uh, in Philippi, in uh, Acts 16, 25, it says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. This will help us here. Uh, what are they singing about? They're singing hymns. What was it about? Jesus Christ exalting him and songs about salvation. His dying for us. And the other prisoners were listening. No wonder they wanted to get saved. What must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer said. Uh, again, these are things that we, well, we might be singing them, but these are things that we say, we speak uh, to one another. And then the spiritual songs, I used to think, what's a spiritual song? I think that's a song that's easy to sing versus a song that's hard to sing. No, that's not it at all. It's a personal testimony. It's a song of a, with the first person in it. I have, follow, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. That's a spiritual song. Uh, these are the things that if, we, if we're controlled by the Spirit of God, we'll find ourselves naturally. Did I make a list of these? I think I better write these things down. No, we'll find ourselves naturally saying these kinds of things uh, one, one to another, encouraging and, and building up uh, the, the body of Christ. Speaking about the faithfulness of God, speaking about uh, the future with God, speaking about what God's already done for us in the past, uh, seeing my life in the context of knowing that God loves me and he's concerned for me. Uh, speaking about uh, issues from the perspective of, of God and what he thinks about them. I think that might make a little difference in, in your homes, uh, in the places uh, where we work. Uh, these are things that please the Lord. Uh, secondly, 
our communication uh, includes singing, not just speaking. Hey, we finally got to the singing here. Singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. We'll find ourselves uh, just, you know, loving to worship the Lord uh, and to sing the Lord. And I realize, you know, not everybody has the, uh, the best uh, voice, but, uh, you know, it's still, hey, make a joyful noise uh, un unto the Lord. And, uh, uh, and if you need to, uh, in your heart. <laughs> but either way, singing. Uh, uh, the making melody is interesting. It means to pluck a stringed in instrument. So, I, so he, I, I think if you're controlled by the Holy Spirit, you need to learn to play the ukulele. I don't know. But it's this idea of, uh, of worship being accompanied by, uh, by music and uh, musical uh, instruments. Uh, and it's very interesting uh, in, in this context of what Paul's saying that, uh, of the Holy Spirit that throughout uh, church history, when God has poured out his Holy Spirit and brought revival to people, there's been a, an awakening and a change in the way the church worships and sings. There's always new songs that, 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 that come along with a, a move of God's, uh, God's Spirit. St. Francis was, was considered the troubadour of God. Uh, during the Wesley revivals uh, in Great Britain, the United States, Charles Wesley wrote 6,000 hymns. Uh, when Moody began his preaching, uh, he sought out Iris Sankey to sing with him at his crusades, and God used him tremendously, although very crit criticized by the British that called it tea kettle music. It was not a compliment, but God used it nonetheless. When Billy Graham, Billy Graham began his crusades, he'd heard a guy named uh, George Beverly Shea sing uh, on the radio a few times, went after him, sought after him, and said, please join me in these crusades. And of course, uh, he was with him for uh, decades. And uh, with our own roots in terms of Calvary Chapel, when the Jesus People revival that began really uh, out of Southern California and Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa began, uh, there was a whole host of musicians and songwriters that God raised up. And the reason that you can walk into a lot of churches around the country uh, today, uh, and it looks a lot like why we do, is because it changed the way that uh, uh, the church worshiped. Uh, we see it uh, historically, uh, but uh, more importantly, we want to see it uh, in our lives. Uh, if we're controlled by the Holy Spirit, there's just going to be some uh, things coming out of our mouth that's a little different in terms of uh, hymns and psalms and spiritual songs that we, uh, we just think, we just think to share. I think this might be a good idea to share this with this, this person. Oh, that turned out well. I think it was the Lord, you know. Uh, we just need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, sometimes that minute by minute, uh, it'll bring a new dynamic uh, to our worship. Thirdly, our communication is saying thanks. Uh, and again, uh, with gratitude in our hearts. The term everything doesn't mean for literally everything. Uh, we, uh, uh, we don't thank God for things that go against the character of God. We're not thankful that there was a 7.9 earthquake in Nepal yesterday. We're not, we're not thankful for everything. Uh, it means Everything in the context that can bring praise and glory to God. We can be thankful that there's Christians on the ground there. Uh, we can be thankful that uh, groups like Samaritan's Purse and Gospel for Asia will, uh, are mobilizing uh, right now to try to get aid uh, to those people. Uh, it's a bad situation. Uh, we're not thankful for everything, literally, uh, but we're thankful for, uh, for everything in terms of those things that bring glory to God. Uh, it's talking about having a a uh, attitude of gratitude uh, in, our, in our hearts. And again, therefore, we, uh, we can't be full of God's spirit and be the grumbling, complaining person. If you're the grumbling, complaining person, I can tell you one thing. God's spirit's not controlling you. <laughs> uh, it's just not. And, and when we find ourselves in that position, we just need to realize what, what's happening here. You know, there's, there's something else controlling me, uh, and it's not God's Spirit. Lord, fill me again. I need to be controlled uh, by your Spirit. It's a continual desire of our hearts, and it produces some wonderful things. Fourthly, our communication includes submission to one another. Warren Wordsby says, Submission has uh, nothing to do with the order of authority, but rather it governs the operation of authority and how it is given and how it is received. Uh, it's from the Greek word hupostasso. It's a military term, and it means to arrange under. In a military context, it's probably the best way to understand it. Uh, and uh, I can probably best uh, illustrate that thinking about a, a scene with uh, <coughs> my son Josh, and he was, uh, he was about a, a junior uh, in high school, and uh, he was doing um, 
we were out at, uh, at Hickam, and he was getting uh, an ID uh, out there for a program that he was in, and uh, I was out there with him, and, uh, uh, and I, I saw this situation coming before we crossed the street, uh, and I said, watch, watch this, and we uh, stood on the side, because I saw a guy that was coming uh, to my right who was a, a tech sergeant. He's probably in his, uh, in his mid, uh, mid-30s uh, or, or so, and uh, from uh, uh, what was on his chest, I could tell he'd been around the block a few times. Uh, and then coming this way was um, a very young-looking baby face, probably a 22-year-old uh, second lieutenant. And I uh, said, watch this. And of course, as they cross, they're outside. So uh, the tech sergeant, the older, more experienced, wiser, knows what he's doing person, he salutes the young guy that doesn't have a clue because he uh, happened to get a college degree, get a commission, and make it through uh, uh, one of the commissioning agencies and, uh, and so forth. And then he returns his salute. Uh, and and uh, I said, is, is, is that guy better than that guy? No, it's just order, hupostasso. There's an arrangement under in the military that they must follow in order to function and to get things done. Uh, and it's the same way in our lives. <clears throat> we submit to one another mutually, not because someone is better than me, but it's in order to accomplish something and get a, a task done. Uh, to show respect uh, for, uh, for one another. Uh, and I can tell you, it makes a difference when people are, are watching our lives and you're the, the vice president of IBM, but you'll submit yourself to the guy that flips hamburgers at Burger King uh, because you're trying to get a task done. That's not done out there in the world. There's a status that must be achieved and, uh, and maintained. And it's not to be that way in the body of Christ. Of course, this whole, this whole thing is going to carry right through uh, in, uh, into the home. Let me just read one thing I got off of uh, a message from uh, David Hawking this week. He said, uh, your ability to influence others will be limited to the degree that you're willing to submit yourself to authority. Your ability to influence others is going to have its limitations if you will not submit yourself to authority. On the job, in the church, uh, at home. Uh, you know, this is, you know, uh, just, uh, just a, as an example, but we, and we'll get into it next week, but uh, the, the mom that refuses to, influ- to submit herself to her husband will limit her influence, not over her husband, but over her children, because they're watching. They're watching. The, the person that's di- that uh, is uh, down the chain of command is, is watching. Uh, if, you're, if you're at work, <clears throat> and you're in some kind of middle management position, and you're trash talking uh, your your boss all the time. The guys under you, what do they think? Well, they're just going to do the same thing. You'll limit your influence to the degree you refuse to submit to authority. It has nothing to do with who's better, who's smarter, who's wiser, or anything else. It's just an arrangement. Hupastaso. It's to be arranged under. Why? Why do we do it then? Verse twenty-one. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's why you do it. It's like, well, I don't really respect that person. How do you respect God? Big. I'd, I'd do that then. You do it for, for God, uh, not, not because the other person deserves it. You do it for God so that then you can have an influence uh, over, over others. Again, so how are we to be careful and wise? How are we to buy back time, make the most of every opportunity? We've, we've got to be uh, spirit-filled. <clears throat> I mentioned I'd, I'd go through this again uh, very quickly. Uh, it's a command. It's not an, uh, a suggestion. You are free to ignore it. It will not impact your salvation in the least. You're free to ignore it, uh, but it is a command. Uh, it's plural, so it's for the whole church. It's passive. We, we just, it's something we allow uh, the Holy Spirit to do. It's something he does. There's no ritual. There's no formula. I mean, if you're in, you're in obvious known sin to yourself, I was just turning away f- from that to turn to God. You're just yielding yourself to the control of the Holy Spirit. It's present tense, so we just got to do it all the time. You might have to uh, pray this uh, 15 times a day. Maybe it's once a week. I, I don't know what's going on in your lives. When you see yourself losing control, when you see yourselves not speaking these things to other people uh, and being a blessing to them and to God, uh, it's time to say, Lord, I need you to take control uh, once again. Why now? Because the days are, are evil. And I just wanted to 
<clears throat> kind of close this off with a little quote from an older uh, Phil Kangi song uh, called uh, Time is Coming to an End. Uh, uh, one of the uh, verses says, well, he, he hasn't, uh, um, well, he hasn't always uh, been around and he won't always be, but he's on the move at this moment measuring life for you and me. I fear we all submit to him uh, existing anxiously. No one is able to turn him off except the Lord who holds the key. When the Lord stops it, that'll be it. Too late for apologies. Too late to forgive your brother. Too late to get on your knees. When the Lord stops it, too late to help the needy. Worst of all, too late to turn. You must face eternity. The chorus, his name is time and he's coming to an end. His name is time. Where will you be, my friend? There's just nothing that says you get a bunch more time. Uh, but we need to recognize, yeah, there's a pressure against us. The days are evil, uh, but we need to walk carefully uh, in the world that we're in. We'll only do that if we're controlled by the Spirit of God. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that, uh, we thank you that, you, that all we have to do is ask and yield, and, and you'll do it. And uh, as we look at these things we've been studying, the things we're going to be studying, and this is the pivotal point here. How do we walk worthy? How do we keep that balance? Uh, only if we're controlled by the Spirit of God. How are we to have a, uh, your presence and a blessing in our home as we go forward in our text? It's only if we're controlled by the Spirit of God. How do we speak things that are meaningful, encouraging, significant to other people in the body of Christ? It's only if we're controlled by the Spirit of God. Lord, so we, we pray. I would suggest every person here prays, since it's a command of God, that, Lord, you would take control of our lives by your Spirit. Lord, and when we realize that we've, we've lapsed in that, we've, uh, in a sense, taken the wheel back over again, that we'd be uh, quite simply willing to move to the passenger side of the car and allow you to take control once again, Lord. Uh, control us for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.